silly old living and take your mother's place by my side. Welcome back to the Sci-Fi Diner Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Scott Herzog. Uh, hello, I'm Miles P. McLaughlin. And we believe that M, right now, currently, at this very moment, is napping. Yes, I fear that might be the case. Uh, yes, and uh, you know, you just can't pass up a good nap. Naps are treasure. They are, and I, just un- I unfortunately don't get enough naps. I mean, right. that's the reality. Mm-hmm. Um, we should have a napping contest in the diner. <laughs> How could we do it? We, we have we have loot. We have loot to give away. We should give loot away for like the uh, the best nap or the best end? pictures of the nap. Maybe maybe it's the best pictures of a nap. Okay, I mean, I was gonna say, how do you judge a? a you know, oh, well, you know, we could we could vote. We could, like best pictures of nap, and we could put them on Facebook and see what people like. Yeah, thumbs up, thumbs down, right? <laughs> um, as long as they're appropriate, appropriate pictures of people napping. Right, right, right. right. Mm-hmm. So uh, we need to start our new. Uh, a new thing on Facebook. Totally <laughs> unsci-fi related, except that M is right now napping, and therefore it's related to this podcast. Uh, I'm sure it would make for a great nap picture. Yeah. It, mm-hmm. should. <laughs> it, it is. Napping. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> talk about the sci-fi diner after dark. There's a different thing altogether. <laughs> All right. Well, Miles, how, how in the heck are you doing? I mean, we released our episode with David Gerard. Well, yeah. Uh, Great interview, uh, mm-hmm. interesting interview, certainly. A- absolutely. I mean, if you're a fan of Star Trek and if uh, Babylon Five, uh, Sliders, um, yeah, and, and 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 we talked about it all. And the books that he's put out. I mean, uh, yeah. he's been doing it a long time, but uh, he's very prolific. Yeah, and you know, here's the thing. You know, if you stay through the music of Babylon Five, mm-hmm. there's even more. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I tacked in some of the out tech takes, and I did have to bust out the phaser to like edited a little bit mm-hmm. which didn't surprise me i left a little bit of it in because i felt like it was just it wasn't terrible mm-hmm. even though it's not stuff we would have personally have said well you know in about 15 minutes we're gonna be bringing the people from uh Farrier. when i say people i'm actually talking about one person probably just uh probably just paul sieber yes yeah so paul mm-hmm. sieber and, and how was he involved with farragut again he he's been involved since day one um as a writer actor producer um he, he he helped launch uh, Farragut when they first got started. That's awesome. And he's also helped. So ten years later, he's still here. He's still here. Um, he's a regular at the cons down in the Maryland area, and he's tried his hand in other Star Trek uh, fan independent productions and other uh, independent productions. So, yeah, he's had a um, great great hobby. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So certainly, it's uh, it will have him on just a little bit. Mm-hmm. And M, by the way, is awake. I just didn't invite her. I invited her in, but she's not here yet. She's at seven thirty. So we're starting a little bit ahead of her. So she'll be joining us in this podcast here tonight. So we were busting her chops for nothing. <laughs> but uh, she can listen to the podcast to find out what we said about her. Um, so Miles, what has been going on in science fiction dumb? If you want to call it that. Um, I am just so happy that uh, Daredevil's back on Netflix. Oh, yeah, that's right. It came back on. And we, we've had... Did you marathon watch it all day today? I watched... No, but Friday when it came... I watched four episodes in a row. Um, and it was good? Hell's Kitchen surviving yet? Uh, it, it is, but it's also... We, there, there's uh, people we've we've interviewed in the past. Uh, we How are, uh, Is Eddie on it? Uh, not Eddie McClintock, no, but uh, Tony Curran, who we talked to last year awesome. from... Um, awesome, the good Scotsman. The, the good Scotsman, he plays an Irish mobster. Uh, also, um, um, let's see, Neil, Neil Grayston from um, oh, yeah, Eureka. Eureka. Yeah, awesome. So he, he was playing a public defender in, in one episode, um, so it, it's cool to see some... So they're bringing in some of the talent that we had. So we yeah. can say that we've interviewed someone from Daredevil. So. We, we can't... <laughs> well, I, <laughs> 
uh, uh, two two people so far. Well, yeah, two people so and that's mm-hmm. just the uh, cusp of the. Uh, so I, I've only seen about six episodes so far, but the worst dare, it, dare it, is good. Is it like a twelve episode season again? I think so, like yeah. 12, 12, 13 episodes. Yeah, yeah, that's becoming more common to do it that way. And right, it makes sense financially from their end. And I, I guess you could get a lot of content out there. I mean, um, after that's over, I mean, well, they they, they introduced. Um, they have the, the character of the Punisher on there. Okay. Um, and he, he's the actor who played um, Rick's friend in season one of um, Walking Dead. Okay. Um, so familiar face there. Uh, they're also introducing the character of Elektra um, on there also. Uh, I'm not familiar with this actress. So, But the, the, the show is... Jennifer Gardner? No. no, no. Different Elektra. Different Electra, yes. <laughs> yes. She played the original Electra, or the one that was just in the movie uh, about 10, 12 years ago. Right, right. Yeah. So I watched that movie. Mm-hmm. That, one, one reason only. The, the Electra movie? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She was also Electra in, in the um, uh, the Daredevil movie, too. Oh, that's right. She mm-hmm. was. I thought there the was. The Ben Affleck a, movie, yeah. That's right. That's mm-hmm. right. That's right. But uh, the, the Daredevil TV show on Netflix is, is phenomenal. Awesome. Mm-hmm. awesome. Uh, so we, that's been going good. So we saw Allegiant last Saturday. I think it's... I was told that's the last... There's a, there was a last book in the series, but they left the end very open-ended that it could, you know, they may try to get a little more mileage out of this. Yeah, well, they often do if they have a successful series. Did, did it do well at the box office? Not sure. Um, but they left... It, 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 yeah, it, it didn't... I mean, they could they could do a... Do a sequel if, if 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 they wanted to. Awesome, awesome, mm-hmm. yeah. So so for me, uh, you, what's going on in my sci-fi world? I, you know, I'm I've been working my way through the Marvel live-action movies with my son. Oh, that's great! And so yeah, it's awesome. It's awesome that we can do it. So we watched Age of Ultron last night, or like it was actually over two nights. We split it up because of he had bedtime, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, he couldn't uh, stay up late and actually not pay for it the next day. <laughs> you know, as adults, we can kind of recover from that. But kids, it's a little bit more difficult. But loved it. Mm-hmm. Loved, love, love Age of Ultron. Um, his favorite Avengers movie so far. Mm-hmm. I guess they're all only two out, right? Um, we have yet in the Marvel Universe. We watch everything but um, Captain America Civil War. Mm-hmm. So we have to, I know that technically comes before Age of Ultron, but he wanted to watch that. I think it does at least. And then um, we have not watched Ant Man, which I realize is kind of casual connected. It, it's yeah, kind of but he, like, he'll be in Captain America Civil War. Right, though. so we have to do that. Mm-hmm. No, did I say Captain America Civil War? I meant Winter Soldier. We okay, haven't, we haven't watched that one yet. Um, and then the, the other one we haven't watched is Guardians of the Galaxy. Okay, and I debated that one because mm-hmm. um, some of the content in that one, the language is a little bit more mature, if I recall correctly. Am I wrong about that? I thought it was. Fairly, maybe it, maybe it's maybe it's much more thick. innocuous. All, all I remember is like the advertisement had him you know, flipping the bird, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it, it it's for the most part pretty family friendly. Okay, well yeah. then maybe it won't be such a big deal. I mean, if you watch, if you let them watch Age of Ultron, I, I can't see <laughs> Guardians of the Galaxy being, being any worse. Being so those are the three that we have, and then it's like watching Civil War live and mm-hmm. uh, getting gearing up for some of the rest. Um. Uh, talking about movies, I, Batman and Superman got fairly good reviews. Is what I've heard. I, I saw, I read something on our on our Facebook page. People said, "Well, some positive vibes come out of this movie." I will probably still see it in theaters. I, th- I mean, I know there's a lot of Ben Affleck hate for Bat for him playing Batman, but the movie does look good. I mean, I, 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 I might go see it. I don't yeah. know if I'll see it with Kiefer, but I might go see it. So I, I mean, uh, I might be able to direct my wife to go see it. Yeah, there we go. Mm-hmm. And the other thing that I'm doing is I'm reading through um, The Way of Kings. This is a Brand, Brandon Sanderson book. Um, been on a Brandon Sanderson kick for, I don't know, eons now. And still loving Brandon Sanderson and The Way of Kings. This, uh, you know, 40-hour book and about five hours left. And hmm. just just really, really enjoying that series and how he's developing it and writes characters and at times it feels like it plods along and there's threads that you aren't sure how they connect, but he always has a way of bringing them all back full circle. And so I'm uh, very anxious to see how that all connects in the next five hours of it. So absolutely thoroughly enjoying, mm-hmm. you know, that. So cool. Oh, when I finished the X-Files, finally, I, I know it's been off the air now for about three or four weeks, um, but I'm th- I thoroughly enjoyed the way they wrapped up that series and it was it was well worth it. I've heard other people say it was nothing but good. Yeah. So, and they left it kind of open-ended. 
mm-hmm. like the possibility of doing another uh, one off because they didn't really resolve it. At least not in my mind. Maybe mm-hmm. maybe you guys listening said, "Oh yeah, they yeah they resolved it," but no, I don't. I didn't. I didn't think that they did. Uh, not much revol- re- resolution there. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess they wanted to see if they can still. If, if there's enough fan interest to keep it going, and, and it, prob- it probably is. I would guess so. There's this idea of nostalgia. I, I, I read an article, I don't know if it was in Time or something, about how nostalgia TV is killing TV. Interesting. And they, they were talking like Heroes Were Born and right. uh, The X-Files and um, Full House and uh, something else that had been rebooted Okay, that they brought back from the dead. So mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know. There's still a lot of new TV I'm still liking. Yes. I mean, um, I mean, Flash and Arrow have kind of been on hiatus for a little while, but um, uh, Hero, uh, um, Le- you know, Legends is really good. That's what I've been hearing. I'm, 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 I'm enjoying the heck out of that. Oh, I'm going to a new convention. Oh, yes. I remember you telling uh, yeah, me. Yeah, so first time I'm ever going to an anime convention. Mm-hmm. So on a lark. One of my students came up to me and said, hey, yeah, I got my costume my cosplay ready to go to this convention. I'm like, hmm, this convention is like right in my back door. Mm-hmm. And let me go ahead and try to get in this press for the Sci-Fi Diners. I put myself and my daughter as an anime correspondent. She's never been on the show, by the way. Um, but I'm going to get her on the show now. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're, and uh, and it was like a couple, it was like uh, about five days past the deadline. I said, you know, I know it's past the deadline, but we've covered such cons. I listed all the cons we covered, and um, and real and, and 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 lo and behold, they uh, accepted us. That's awesome. They said, "Yeah, sure, come." And best of all, we get to interview our good friend, mm-hmm. Vic Vic Banana. Yeah, yeah, Vic from, from Star Trek continues. Star Trek continues. He's mm-hmm. there uh, promoting his anime stuff. So three of the people that voice anime we're going to be interviewing and there's a bunch of others that are there but those are the ones that we seem to be interviewed mm-hmm. interview with and my my daughter is just excited that she, we get to interview someone from Bleach mm-hmm. so, so that, that, that should be fun yeah it should be good mm-hmm. alright well in a moment here we're going to bring on uh, Paul and M, and uh, so uh, we'll be back right after this Joko Cruz is awesome. Joko Cruz is amazing. Just really great talent on the on the cruise. Lots of people. This year was very game oriented, very tabletop oriented, which was cool. A lot of great authors. Um, there were some great musicians and some comedians. It was it. It's the biggest cruise that I've seen. I think we were twelve hundred, and for twenty seventeen, we actually have the whole boat. Wow. It's uh, going out of San Diego, yeah. and um, they got uh, Holland America. We chartered a whole boat, and they opened up uh, pre, pre-order, pre like pre-booking uh, a month ago for people who were booked on Joko 2016 as kind of a like, here you go. Here's a, here's a, here's a gift. We're going to let you, a month before <laughs> your cruise even takes place, book the next cruise. And so those four weeks that that booking was open, by the time we were on the boat for the second night, they had actually booked up enough berths that it was the same amount of people who were currently on the cruise. Wow. So it's unbelievable how huge it's getting. And just the gaming track was amazing. Um, Chris Bedell, who is the, the creative mind behind uh, Greater Than Games and Sentinels of the, Universe, of the Multiverse. Right. I got to play an RPG with him as my DM. I mean, awesome. come on. That was the nerdiest, funniest, funnest thing. Um, we had geek trivia that was an homage to Think Geeks Geek Trivia. And I got to host. And my friend uh, John Riley and I worked super hard on getting the questions and stuff together. And we actually got like the the folks from Looney Labs and Greater Than Games and then... Um, cheap ass games gave us stuff for prizes which was so cool 
And I got to, you know, I sat and listened to Will Wheaton and I sat and listened to Rhea Butcher and John Colton and Jonathan Colton and John Scalzi, who's a great author. And um, just all these amazing people that that you, you you know, you get a little one on one time or just a little fan time or even just have a conversation that's not at all related to anything that you do in life. So that was just it was fun. It was very relaxing. And personally, uh, it was something I definitely needed. I needed to blow off some steam because the last year has just been so tense. Oh, yeah. No and um, there was one particular day we were out on a catamaran for this sunset cruise and very lightly dressed, good looking young men were pouring drinks heavily. And I don't remember much of the rest of the evening. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I do know that I was with friends and we had a good time. And, you know, I didn't accidentally order myself a thousand dollars worth of new computer equipment. And so that's good. That, that's <laughs> always good. And you got to hang out with your personal friend, Will Wheaton. It's semi person. He's, he's a, the, just the neatest I saw dude. The picture. I actually I got, saw more, the I got time to sit and chat with Ann Wheaton, I, yeah. um, especially Europe. since she broke up with Twitter because of Twitter. Well, and she just gets stupid amounts of threats because of her husband. And there are people who are just really cruel and unkind. And we, we got talking about that. And, and I said, you know, there was, she's, she's just such a giving kind person. I don't, I don't get, I don't get where that comes from. Yeah. And um, she was telling me a little bit about how she was invited to the offices of Twitter to discuss that kind of thing and how to protect Twitter users from that kind of, you know, crap. And so that was really neat. That was super fun. Awesome. Um, there was a British musician called Imogene Heap who is who makes music with gloves. These gloves that she is kind of these haptic gloves that um, by using one of those connects. Mm-hmm. She has hooked that up to a computer and some musical instruments and with certain hand motions and swipes creates music. And it's amazing. It's haunting. Like I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it. <laughs> Seeing her do it live was the coolest thing. And what is her name so again? So I can't, I can't recommend that enough. What's her name again? Imogene he- Heap. Okay. So we can look her up on like YouTube or something like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. It is the coolest thing. I loved her music forever and I'd never, ever seen her live at all. So to see that was the coolest. Hmm. Very good. All right. That's awesome. I'm glad you had a good cruise. And I did. Hey, is this the show? Cause this is, I like this, this chitter chatter. Oh, I'm just, I, 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 I started recording soon after I stopped recording with, with Paul. <laughs> oh. I figured that out. So I, so I, I learned my lesson. Oh, brother. So. What have you guys been up to? Am are you watching uh, Daredevil? I am. We've, we're only on the third episode. My roommate and I have been watching it, like, very carefully. We're, we're, I'm trying not to um, power watch. Okay. We, there's, there's a couple close personal friends that we've uh, interviewed uh, that, we'll, that you'll see make, make some guest appearances oh. soon. That's cool. One, one, one of my friends said that he noticed in a courtroom scene that the American flag has 54 stars on it. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's interesting. I know. I don't know that much about the Marvel. I don't know that much about Daredevil's universe or what they're doing in the universe because um, I'm a little behind. I've got like two months of comic books to read. That, so, that would and seem never, significant, though. It must be. If for I mean, for the nerds to point it out, they, they put it there for a reason. They definitely put it there for a reason. Hmm. Well, um, I almost I almost squeed when I saw th- this guy on, on that we, we talked to that just, just this past uh, short. Oh, oh, I kind of want to know, but I don't want to know. Okay, that, you'll see it episode four. Yeah, I, th- I think. What do you think of it so far? Oh, I, I, the worst it gets is good. Uh, so and, and, it, and it's been great. Yeah, I'm loving. Wow. I'm, I'm still loving it. Awesome. Awesome. Were there, um, you've seen Jennifer Jones then? Yeah, I watched Jennifer Jones. Or Jessica Jones, I'm sorry. Yeah, Jessica Jones, yeah. So does it tie well into that? It's in, they did actually make, um, they, they, they actually mentioned her at one time uh, because there's, because there's a fear of vigilantes and uh, so they, they just, they dropped her name once. Okay. So... And it's in New York, and Jessica Jones is in New York, too. Well, they made reference to the big guy who doesn't get as hurt as bad as Matt does. 
So I'm guessing that's um, Luke. Is it Luke? Yeah. What's Luke Strong? No. I don't Luke, remember his last name. Luke, but he's getting Luke his own Big, show they're talking about. Luke Big Tall? Luke Strongman. What? <laughs> I, I, I don't. I don't know. I, I don't know what his last name is. But uh, oh, it's gonna drive me crazy! I have the internet right in front of me. Why am I waiting? Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so yeah, you've you know you've seen. I've seen the first three episodes. Mm-hmm. Luke Cage. That's his name. Thank you, internet. <laughs> yeah. Oh, are you? Are any of you guys watching Supergirl? I, uh, I, no, I am not right now. I, I mean, when, when, yeah, when, maybe when we, there's no shows going on, maybe I'll get, check that out. Did you see the Flash crossover? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I haven't seen it yet. So I'm a little behind on that too, but I haven't been watching Supergirl. But I, I, they had the crossover with, um, with what's his name? Uh, on uh, the, oh, the show that got canceled. Oh, this is, I'm really good. I'm on top of it today. Uh, um, the Flash was canceled. No, no, it's still. But there it, was a show that was on CBS that got canceled, but then his character showed up on, on, uh, on Arrow. Mm. John something. You took Constantine? Yes. Okay. So Constantine showed up, and I thought that was really cool. So to to see that they're kind of mixing the CW, they're doing it again, mixing the CW and the CBS stuff is kind of nice. Mm-hmm. And then I just finished the book um, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. Mm-hmm. Uh, your daughter should read this book. If she, <laughs> everyone should read this book. It is the cutest, most awful, most wonderful book ever. As someone who grew up wanting to be Elizabeth Bennett, it's it's a great book. Yeah. I even convinced Will to go see it because it's basically um, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon meets Downton Abbey. Come on, no response from you guys? No, 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 no response at all. No, you know, um, <laughs> yeah. I really, I really do need to see it and watch it, and uh, but I, uh, I don't know if my daughter would be into it. She not a Jane Austen fan or a zombie no, fan? No, no, not really. All right. No. Yeah, you know, whatever. It's not for it's everyone. It's super cute. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's it. Do we have anything else we need to talk about? To- you guys reading anything? Yeah, yeah. I'm reading. Well, I mean, Brand- Brandon Sanderson. I've been in a Brandon Sanderson kick forever. I've been like the Mistborn uh, series, both the. Uh, Mistborn and then the uh, Alloy Law series, which ties in. And, uh, and then I've been reading The Way of Kings, which is another series that ties in. I mean, what he has done is basically created these separate series that are all coming together and tying into the same universe. Ooh. It's pretty ambitious. I think what I've heard is that by the, by the end, there'll be about 50 books that tie in. And I thought, holy Hannah, that's an ambitious project. But I'm really enjoying them. So, and I was telling Miles earlier that I'm watching like all the live action Marvel movies with Kiefer. Uh huh. And he's loving them. Oh yay! Yeah, so we just finished Age of Ultron. We Winter Soldier, Ant Man, and Guardians of the Galaxy yet, and then I think we're caught up. So, okay. So. You don't take him to see Daredevil. What? Don't like of the Marvel universe. No Daredevil for him, or no, not no. Daredevil. Um. Deadpool? What's his name? Oh, Lord of Mercy. Deadpool. Also a red suit. Yes, Deadpool. Yeah, no. Don't let I, him see that. I'm not planning it because he doesn't because Deadpool doesn't really play into I mean, that's more the Wolverine universe, the X-Men universe, right? It is, but there's he may he may show up with like the Inhumans and show up in the X-Men stuff. So are you well, are you including the X-Men in I the not, into the Marvel I, universe? I have not included or the just X-Men. what the we, the Whedons had created. Yeah, I'm just no. I'm just doing the Marvel universe, uh, not the X Men. So, okay. So. I'm not saying I will. I'm not saying we won't ever touch the X Men, but at this point, that's not what we're into. So. Okay. But, yep. So that's kind of it. Well, well, we got a lot coming up, though. We've got Batman versus Superman. We've got um, Captain America. Yeah, Pride and Prejudice versus Zombies. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 
And I, we, we went to see London Has Fallen, and that's a horrible, horrible, amazingly great, awful movie. I want to see it. I do want to see it's it. It's great. You have to watch it. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I just, uh, you know, God's in it. But... Yeah, but he's only the vice president. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, um, I got to get going. I'm exhausted here. But, okay. But I uh, hope your allergies feel better. And um, we'll look at uh, doing something in two weeks. We still have um, our uh, Simon Tam interview we got to release. Mm-hmm. So. Okay. Um, I am waiting to hear from Awesome Con. Uh, but I also reached out to the folks from um, the that the Museum of Science Fiction, Good. they're getting back to me next week with what panel they want us to run. Good. And Good. I, I've definitely signed up for myself because I live here. Right. But the they they're if you guys can make it, awesome. All right. If they can't, I was gonna see if um if Frage would do it. All right. But I, I would rather have you guys down. I would love here. to be there. You know, and if fun. I can't, if I can't make it, the other option would be maybe to like Skype in or something. I don't know how well that would work, but we've done that sort of thing before. So. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we have one more year to wait for Star Trek to come back to the small screen. And we have to wait till summer for Star Trek Beyond comes to the movie theaters. However, there's some really good live action Star Trek you can be watching right now. The folks from Starship Farragut have been giving us quality classic Trek for the last 10 years with eight live action episodes and two animated episodes in the spirit of the animated series. If you've been a listener to our podcast for any length of time, then you know we've talked with the folks from Farragut before. But now we have the opportunity to talk with uh, Mr. Paul Sieber, an actor, writer, producer for the Starship Farragut series. Mr. Sieber, welcome and thank you for taking time to talk with us in the Sci-Fi Diner well, podcast. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's fantastic to be here. Uh, it's, it's always great seeing you at the cons. Um, I mean, Indeed. You, um, but you've been uh, a part of Starship Farragut for a while, but you've lent your talents to other fan and independent uh, film efforts before. What, what first got you into doing uh, fan and independent films? Well, it's actually it, it's 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 one of those those uh, bizarre uh, stories of just you know things just kind of fell into the right place. I hadn't been to a science fiction or a Star Trek convention in, in probably over a decade. And uh, so about 11 years ago, I decided uh, when I had moved, I'd been down in the D.C. area for a while, and I said, hey, there's a con up in Baltimore. And I said, you should go check it out for the weekend. So I decided to go up and see it, and I met a couple of folks from uh, the group that does uh, now called Star Trek Phase Two New Voyages, and I also met John Broughton there. And um, so the uh, guys up at uh, Phase Two invited me to come on up when they were doing some filming, and uh, John, and having some conversation with him sitting in the same room meeting those fellas, he said, you know, I'm thinking about doing something like that down here in the D.C. area. And I'm like, you're probably crazy. I don't know what this thing takes. I've never even really had heard of a fan film before. So I started poking around on the web, and I started seeing stuff like Starship Exeter, which was one of John's biggest inspirations for Farragut. And I said, you know what, this could be fun. So I went up and I helped those guys for a uh, for a week and uh, built some sets and laid some carpet. And I uh, came back down, and John said, what do you think? And I said, okay, let's try to put something together. And uh, I worked with him on helping put together a pilot script, and um, the rest is uh, a decade of history, I guess, if you will. <laughs> so it was just kind of one of those things where I, unintentionally I met some folks, and uh, I, had done, I had done a lot of acting in college back in the dark ages. Um, <laughs> so uh, we would like to go back and say how long ago that was, a long time ago. But um, so it was just, you know, so I, was, I wasn't a stranger to, uh, to performing, but um, it hasn't been anything I had done in, in quite some time. And my original thought um, when I got together with John was I thought, you know, maybe I'm interested in being a filmmaker. And I thought, you know, all this behind the scenes stuff. So when you look at the first Fergus episode, it's also because we didn't have any crew. Um, we did a little bit of everything. I did everything from set construction. Uh, I directed it. Uh, I wrote the pilot. Um, we worked on post-production, we worked on props, we worked on costumes, and I made an amazing discovery was, for the most part, um, I hate most of that stuff. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, most wow. of that production stuff, and it's like, you know, wow, that's not me. Um, I really, really 
Um, but I did decide I liked the acting stuff, and then um, and I didn't think I would get back into the writing. But uh, the uh, the Farragut guys were uh, working. I had uh, stepped away from the show for a while, and um, they were looking for something new and something different. And I had uh, pitched a story idea to uh, John back when he was actually doing some work with uh, the Phase Two guys. Back when both of them were more on a uh, on a working together basis, and I had pitched like a two-part episode. It was a crossover story called Fathers and Sons, and um, just because I had thought of it, and I had a big story arc in there for my character. Ooh, it was great. I had this huge story arc for Prescott. Ooh, and uh, but really, John wasn't interested in really working with you know. He wanted to make something that was just fair. And I said, well, what if I retooled that story? And um, so I did, and that became the price of anything. And uh, so that episode kind of came out of an idea from years before. I cannot tell you how many drafts, but a two-hour epic crossover film became a 35-minute action story. Um, so there was a big change in that. But after that point, I really started to get a lot more confidence in the writing, and that's when I kind of uh, moved forward with the, uh, the next two things that I wrote for Farragut. That's awesome. That's awesome. Now, um, I assume that you know, you're a child of the 60s. Is that correct? I was born in the '60s. Okay. <laughs> well, the, 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 the only reason I ask is I didn't know how much. Let's just let all we can say is I do have my AARP card. That's right. Farther I'm going to go. Oh, that's nothing. They've been sending me that since I was 30. That's right. So, yeah, but I'm but I was actually able to get it this year. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> Never mind. In a few years, I'll be able to get mine too. So yeah, it's I, no big deal. Yeah. And, well, and, and the first time I pulled it out in a restaurant for my discount, my wife frowned at me for 20 minutes. <laughs> oh God! Aww. And then and she goes, "Wait a minute, our desserts for free." I'm like, "Uh huh." Yeah, right. See, yeah, see, not so bad. Well, the, re- the only reason <laughs> the only reason that I asked is I didn't know if you actually saw Star Trek when it was on the first time, or if you caught it in reruns. You know, I really, um, as a kid, I probably, I, I, I've always been, and it, this is going to be terrible to say. And you're going to, I hope nobody takes this the wrong way. Fans don't take it the wrong way. I'm not a Trekkie, um, or a Trekker. That's okay. Yeah. Um, I'm a, I'm a fan of science fiction. Uh, Star Trek happens to be one of the science fiction things that I appreciate. I, cool. I like the fact that um, it was a TV show about science fiction that would, in its finest, dealt with the people, who they were, and it dealt with social issues. Mm. And I heard a show that did that. But I was also, as a kid, I was a huge fan of, uh, uh, I, I'm before they were called Whovians or anything like that, I was watching back Doctor Who back when Pertwee was new. So, I mean, so I go back to... Uh, you know, to a lot of these, uh, a lot of different science fiction shows. So uh, I, I watched it when I was a kid. I couldn't tell you when I started watching it. I wasn't one of those kids that played Star Trek um, when I was a kid. Um, I get trapped at conventions when people start quoting me chapter and verse and actor and episode number and who the guest star was and everything. And I, I don't know. I always have to refer to it as, remember the episode with the thing in it? That's usually how I refer <laughs> to it. Remember the episode that had that thing in it? it took me right. years to figure out Doomsday Machine was the one with a big cornucopia. You know, I was ready for fruit to come out of the end. So it's kind of cool <laughs> Thanksgiving thing. <laughs> but I mean, but it was just, you know, so it was one of those things where so I, I, I enjoyed it. Um, I wouldn't say that it, it, when I was a kid that I put it on any bigger pedestal um, than other science fiction. Right. But um, I definitely, you know, I definitely was, uh, I, I would say I was a fan, but I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, uh, you know, like you know, if you talk to John Broughton, you know, John Broughton was a was a Star Trek nut from the first day he saw it. Right. You know, I admire that in some people. You know, to me, to me, the the, the equivalent of a Trekkie is is the equivalent of someone who's a sports nut and can quote you every stat on their favorite team. I, I find it no different than a Trekkie who can quote you every episode name. No, I agree. With yeah, that. but there's something to be said for that though. That mm-hmm. being. Because you find a lot of people, I, 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 I feel sad if people are chastising you for not, the fact that you found something about it that spoke to you, that's the essence of Star Trek. There's something there for everybody. You don't have to be a sci-fi person, person. you don't have to be an astronomy person, you don't have to be a fan of cheesy 60s TV shows specifically. Mm-hmm. There's there's something there that, that, that each person can do. Onto and that's kind of neat that not only you found that thing that you like and now mm-hmm. you get to make the thing that you like exactly exactly you know that's and that's really kind of where a lot of the basis for for the stories the way I've been writing them I mean other than the captaincy which was just my first foray at saying we're gonna write a Star Trek script you know and I really had no idea what the heck I was doing 
But when I wrote The Price of Anything, I, I had time to sit down and really examine you know, what it was what I was going to do. Because I wasn't even sure if I submitted this film because I had, wasn't working with it at the time. If they were even going to do it. So it was really, for me, was a matter of, um, you know, what would I want to see if I was going to, uh, to me, in the essence of what made the show great when it was on originally. And that was, you know, the idea of the social issues talking about people. And I thought, you know, what, what's kind of a social issue that... Um, that exists, that's something that, that, that I haven't seen on certain, I haven't really seen them addressed. And then I was talking to a friend of mine um, that uh, him and his wife had split up, and I thought, wow, there it is, divorce. You know, divorce has a major impact on families, on people, on, on how kids develop. And they, this couple had waited until the kids were older before they got divorced. But that still has an impact. So I thought, gee, would it be interesting if you talked about these characters? Um, in Star Trek. And what we talked about the fact that what if Captain Carter is a child of divorce and that divorce left him to be estranged from his father. You have that whole story. So there was a whole, the whole thing came out of wanting to deal with this social issue and then trying to make that fit in science fiction. Okay, how do I get them together in a science fiction world? You know, the same way you have the, the episode with the guy with the black on one side of his face and the white on the other. I can never remember the name of that one. Um, but that episode of Star Trek, which was talking about racism but in such a rudimentary way. Oh, no, they were reversed. You know, so, you know, how do I talk about that in Star Trek kind of a thing and get them back together? And I thought, well, we'll go with a little cliche as you think the dad's died. He wants to reconnect. So, I mean, so that became my basis for uh, foray into what I, when I started actually writing Star Trek the way I wanted to see it. And we got a lot of kudos for that story because it wasn't what a lot of the other fan stories did. Right. I mean, you'll see a lot of the Star Trek fan stories, and I'm not ripping on anybody, believe me, because I think anyone who does a Star Trek fan film is, you know, you gotta you got to give them credit right off the bat. But, I mean, the thing that I've noticed a lot of them, a lot of them want to talk about, let's talk about war, and this is the one about the war, and this is the one about this war, and that's the one about that war. Star Trek's a lot more than war. Oh, sure. And if you're going to talk about war, talk about war in a more interesting way. Talk about its effect on things instead of just... How many space battles can you do in CGI? And I'm afraid that's what a lot of them get into. Is, you know, how many ship shots can we show blood? If you're going to have that ship get hit, have it, have it for a reason. Have, have there be a basis behind it. Right. Um, have it have an impact on the characters. So really, when we deal with uh, the newest episode, The Crossing, and the follow-up episode, which is called Homecoming, which we're actually in post-production for now, it's really a two-part story. Homecoming picks up a few days after The Crossing ends. And it's really about the aftermath of what happened. <clears throat> so the crossing kind of gave me an ability to tell a more settled down story that, yeah, a lot of this action stuff and very harsh things happened in the crossing. But that had an effect on these people. You know, what is the end result of that? You know, uh, what happens? Captain Carter's best friend just, just went on. With, uh, am I giving spoilers? Have people nope. seen that episode yet? So is nope. it okay if I use a spoiler? It's, it's, it's been out for a while now on the internet. So, so. but I mean, but I mean, you have an impact where you have the captain's best friend just left, um, and at the same time, he's reunited with an old friend who dies, um, sacrifices himself, and he has to be the one to push the button. Come on, right. that's you can't tell me that's not going to have an impact on a person. Absolutely. So yeah. In the homecoming story, it does. You have this guy who's pretty much a workaholic starship mm -hmm. captain who's not Kirk, who's his own person, who basically he's fried, and he decides, I'm going to go home and visit my mom. I mean, that might sound kind of silly, but how many of you have ever had like a bad weekend and the first thing you ever think of is, oh, I'd like to go home and visit mom. Maybe right. she'll make me spaghetti or, or a pie or something. It, it's that kind of a thing with the captain. He's, just, he's that burned out that it's like, you know what, I'm going to step away. And then, of course, we get into a little scenario there and another scenario on the other side and so forth. But, I mean, you've got to make it a little more interesting. It can't just be go visit mom and have a whole episode with two of them eating spaghetti. You know, that wouldn't be very much fun. But, um, you know, unless it was a good recipe. But, you know, hey, that's <laughs> the Italian half of me talking. But, I mean, so, so you, you know, when you, when, you, so when you look at the good Star Trek episodes, I mean, to me, that's always been the ones that have made the difference. The ones that and explore the human condition. What's that? The ones that explore yeah. the human condition. Exactly, exactly. And I think that that's the one thing that a lot of fan films could work on better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Once again, I am not putting down. Some of them are incredibly ambitious, you know. But I wish that they spent more time talking about the human condition, and not in an overblown scale, but in a simple scale. Yeah. You know, in, a very, in very simple terms. I mean, sometimes they'll talk about those things, but they'll talk about them in such a huge way, you're like, 
you know, bring it down a peg. These are supposed to be people. You know, the best science fiction is the science fiction that talks about the people. I don't know if have you folks um, seen um, uh, seen Interstellar. Yes. Oh, yeah. I'm sure you have. That's the most humanistic science fiction film I've ever seen. You just nailed exactly what I was going to say. Sorry. <laughs> it, no, but I'm saying, isn't that story completely about the people? It is. It, is. Yeah. it just it, happens to happen in space. It happens to happen with science fiction. It's, all, it's about family. It's about love. It's about the connections. I mean, wow. Just yeah. like when you watch The Martian, which, by the way, um, uh. I was going to say Matt Damon should have got the Academy Award. I haven't watched Revenant yet, um, which I need to, but I just watched Apollo or Creed. Uh-huh. Oh, Creed. And mm. i got to tell you what, I watch it. Please go watch it. You're yeah. going to be surprised because I was. Yeah. It's Very epic. So. All it, those films are epic. It was. It, it, it harkens back to what made the original Rocky great. Mm-hmm. But um, anyhow, putting that aside, um, when you watch something like The Martian, yeah, there's science there. I'm going to science the shit out of this and so forth in the story. <laughs> but at the same time, it's really about it's about a person. It's about survival, getting past loneliness, getting past all that. It's amazing the human story, right. you know, in that. And that's what makes great science fiction. Great science fiction is about the human element. Mm-hmm, it's right. about the people. When you take the people part out of it, it just becomes a, a Michael Bay film with a lot of explosions. I don't enjoy the Transformers movies. Why? <laughs> There's no human element there. You could have made a robot movie with human element. Right. But they didn't. Yeah. You know, Transcendence is all about the human story and a machine. Right. So you can do it, you know, it is capable of doing it, but that to me is an example of, you know, no, they didn't yeah. in that film. But when you watch something, like I said, like Interstellar, boom, it is, it is completely. Um, and the reason that to me it was a wonderful film was because of that, because it's entirely about people and the relationships and so forth. And that's what makes it work. And that's what makes the best Star Trek work. Why do people love Wrath of Khan so much? It's not just because of the battles between the two ships. It's because of that whole story about aging and accepting yourself for who you are with Kirk and this whole idea of the vengeance thing with Khan. By the way, I know the movie's better than I do this TV episode. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, it's that whole story of, you know, holding on to hatred and what that does to you internally. You know, you know it, it's, 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 it's a very human story in many ways. It's a very human story in many ways. And that's what makes it work. Yeah. And considered by many fans the best Star Trek movie of the series. I still think it is, mm-hmm. and that's what I got annoyed with in the last J.J. Um, Abrams film, that they tried to steal that thunder for his film, and mm-hmm. they, I wish they'd have done something new. Yeah. Yeah. I could see where they were going, though. I mean, they were trying, they were testing the waters on what they could do, and they wanted to create something, they, they wanted to, to push the envelope a little bit, and considering how long it's been since Khan was, has been out. You know, I, can, I can't disagree. I mean, I do agree with you. Hold on, I gotta sneeze, guys. Wait. That's all right. You okay? I think she muted. Oh, it, it went away. So I have my like every tree in the world is against me right now. <laughs> <laughs> They're all. No, but I mean, you 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 have, you have a very good point, and 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 once again, I don't I don't disagree with that. Um, at the same time, um, I'm not one of those purists that says oh, I don't like JJ Trek because. You know, it's not it's not the original series. Oh, come on. You can remake something. You can reinvent and make better. I would rather, though, that J.C. J. Abrams have just said, I'm going to start it all over from scratch and ignore everything before. Mm-hmm. I would rather he did that than this whole thing. Well, it's kind of the same universe, but it's an offshoot because we change history. We'll bring old Spock and, you know what? Do what Battlestar Galactica did. I'm going to ignore it. Right. I'm going to use the themes... Mm-hmm. I'm going to use the basis and the concept, and I'm going to move on. Watch John Carpenter's The Thing. Okay, that's a remake. Does it salute the original in any way, shape, or form? No. <laughs> yeah. Should it? Yes. No. Yeah. It doesn't have to. It's a reinvention of that idea, a reinvention of that story. So I, the, I'm cool with that. Let me. Do you, do you think... Kind of, we're it's we're still talking about Star Trek, but I'm going to take mm-hmm. it a little please. Do you think that it's just it was kind of a calculated decision in that you've got all the Trek fans who have grown up? I mean, I still have from my uh, my Happy Meal, my my Star Trek the motion picture wrist bracelet, the plastic <laughs> thing that you could run the multicolor thing through and see the secret messages. I still have that. That. I, do you think that that this kind of amalgam that JJ came up with 
was a way to keep a lot of the older purists happy and some of the newer ones because they've had kids and now their kids are having kids and they're they want them they want to create the whole new generation who enjoys the Star Treks especially now since they're I'm, I'm pretty sure they were talking about a TV show back when the first mm -hmm. uh, re JJ movie came out um, so do you think maybe it was calculated in that? I think it was with the first new, one. took some old. Yeah, I think it was with the first one. I think it was a calculated risk. <clears> Once <throat> again, me being the kind of person I am, I'd rather you just, because I have a couple of things. One is, I don't care about those characters till they're on that ship as a crew. I, I don't care what they were like as kids. I don't like the Anakin Skywalker syndrome where I guess he was, he was a bratty kid. You know, oh, Kirk was a bratty kid. And, oh, Spock was a misfit kid. I don't care. I don't care about them till they're the crew of that ship. I really don't. But if you'd have started from scratch at that point, I'd have been satisfied. But yeah, I do agree with you that maybe they were trying to placate that audience a little bit, give them this kind of a time. And I'll give you that on the first film. But on the second film, no. You, you okay. could have just gone off on your own. Now, if it was a TV series and you wanted to take a chance with an episode and see what you could play with, well, I got 20 episodes to do that with. You could take that chance with this week's. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't work, I don't do anything like that next week. But not when it's a film, and it may not be another film for several years. Mm -hmm. I think at that point, you really kind of push it the wrong direction. You, what you come back with is saying is, I can't be original. As a matter of fact, I'm even going to do the con line as a yell, but I'm going to have somebody else say it. Right. It's like, you know, you, 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 you missed out on opportunities. You have Benedict Cumberbatch in your film. You've got Benedict Cumberbatch in your film. So what do you do? You pick the whitest English actor you, <laughs> you can and have him play the seek. Yeah. Really? I mean, I understand Ricardo Montalban isn't a Sikh. He's not Indian. But he's he could Possibly, he could at least possibly pass for someone from that kind of a country because he had the skin and the hair, you know, and there was at least a Benedict Cumberbatch. A... I wish they would have dropped so the line. So I'm going to bring something really? up that we had this <laughs> we had this argument when we were reviewing that those movies. Um Technically, I am the palest person on earth, but I am a Spaniard. I don't look like any of my people. I don't sound like any of my people, but I am a Spaniard. So mm -hmm. there, I have friends who are blonde, blue-eyed, and were born and raised in India and have those really cool accents because they, they went to British school, but they are Indians and they are... They are Muslim. The, so I, I'm going to give it a stretch that they went. They instead of going, let's 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 make this person look like what we think they look like, and just kind of threw that to the wind. So I'm and, I, and, I, and I will and I will give you that. But I think it was also a waste to take that character and make him rehash somebody else's role. Mm. Okay. I mean, you got you got you got Benedict Cumberbatch. I know, give him seriously. his own character. Freaking give him Sherlock his own Holmes. villain. You know what I mean? Uh, give him something else. And by the way, Doctor Strange, great casting. I know, I right? Cannot wait, cannot wait. Uh, One delicious. of my favorites. See, see, everyone that they're calling the the, 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 the the phase three and the lesser superheroes to bring on out, those are the ones I liked. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like Doctor Strange. Sorry, you got me happy. But boy, I, but that's one of those ones where I think filmmaking had to catch up with the character. There's no way without the effects they could do now, you could have done Doctor Strange and did it right. Because right. you figured not that long ago, it would have been awful. Yeah. So speaking of the effects and stuff, if uh, budget unlimited for you, what would you write? What 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 story do you want to tell, and how do you want to tell it? Well, I'm actually I'm actually writing a, a feature screenplay right now, um, which I'm hoping to be able to produce, which is a uh, modern day retelling of Frankenstein, hmm. but with uh, modern sensibility. I'm writing it um, as it was originally intended, which is a drama, not a horror or science fiction film. So, um, yes, so we'll have to see how that comes to play. And I'm, I'm hoping to have a, a try to raise a reasonable budget when I go to produce. I will be working with Farragut Films um, to do that. Um, obviously, I've got a great group of folks that I'm working with right now, uh, right. filmmakers and effects people and film producers and costumers Absolutely. and makeup people. And it'd, I'd, be, I'd be remiss to try to reinvent the wheel. Right. Uh, and do that. And it would be a, a nice foray for Farragut Films to finally work their way into maybe something that's uh, completely our own property, um, which would be a nice direction to go in the future, too, particularly with all the stuff going on with how long we're going to be able to do Star Trek. Uh, you know, oh, yeah. currently 
making its way around the airwaves. So um, it will be nice to try to do something different. So I am working on that screenplay as well as I'm writing the uh, screenplay for the new Farragut Forward series, episode two. Okay. So, which I think you guys, you guys were like, we're building up to something big in that one. If you recall the end credits scene at the end of The Crossing. I, I did, and I was that there. That is one of three. Ah, did yeah, I was, you see it? I, I, saw it, I saw it Saturday evening at, at Farpoint, so I, you, you guys knocked it out of the park. You, it was fantastic. Well, the, um, the little scene that happens at the end, there'll be a scene at the end of the end credits of The Crossing, which uh, you already got to see. Mm -hmm. um, there'll be a scene at the end credits of Homecoming, which is the final Fer uh, Starship Farragut episode. Then we move to Farragut Forward, which moves the whole series to the movie era, um, Rathacon era. Um, there'll be a little end credits sequence at the end of that episode. They All three of those lean up to Farragut Forward episode two. Um, which is uh, tentatively titled, according to my screenplay on my laptop, um, Confession of Pain. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun. Actually, because of a Latin proverb, revenge is but a confession of pain. Ooh. I was going to say, I mean, uh, moving into the movie era, Star mm -hmm. Trek, I mean, no, no fan or independent. I mean, there have been attempts to try to m make... Um, uh, episodes in, in that era, but uh, there were there were two fan attempts I recall uh, over time to do stuff in era, and both of them uh, ended pretty abruptly. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and neither one of them got past a trailer, as far as I can remember. I remember, it was a USS Hathaway. Um, I'm going to say about seven or eight years ago, um, they did a trailer. They had uh, supposedly four stories written. Um, never happened. Mm -hmm. um, that one was one that I recall, and there was one other fan one too. But really, it's not been um, it's not been something that uh, the fans have had any luck with. I, I think it's um, you know folks look at a lot of um, the potential for that and uh, see it to be kind of daunting, and uh, you know so they don't uh, they don't try. Uh, to go that direction. So, you know, I'd say, you know, I say why not? I think it opens up the door to um, some more interesting stories. Right. You know, so I say, you know, why not give it a shot? Right. Oh, I you love know, the movie. Or... Shot? I, I like the idea of trying something a little, you know, I like the idea of trying something a little bit different. You, you're you definitely... Know? And um, it's not just, um, it's not just to me, it's not just, uh, I guess how we would say, it's not just for... Uh, the idea of um, moving that forward, but the whole idea is, it, 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 John and I have talked about it, we make little jokes about it, is we did, we, Farragut's been going on for 10 years. They've aged 10 years. Right. <laughs> you know, you got other fans almost working for a decade and you're trying to play, still play the fifth season. You know, it's after a while, you don't look like you're in the fifth season anymore. <laughs> you know, what you end up doing, recasting everybody, you know, we're getting a little bit old for this. I mean, uh, other Star Trek shows, we've got the lead actor playing a 36-year-old character and the actor's in his 50s. Well, guess what? I'm in my 50s. I don't look 36, you know. Right. So it's just a matter, you know, it's just a matter of, you know, give it a shot and see what happens. But, you know, let's acknowledge, you know, the time has passed. Plus, too, I think people, um, they want to see, you know, what happens to these people. You know, they want to, if, if they like these characters, I think one of the reasons The Crossing worked out so well was that, um, you know, People liked those characters enough that um, they kind of cared what um, they cared what happened to them. You know, they saw what happened to them and said, "Ooh, you know, what goes on with these people?" So I was able to do an episode that flashed back to previous Farragut episodes. It wasn't necessarily playing off as much of uh, Star Trek as much as playing off of what Farragut already did. Something mm -hmm. you can get away with that if, if people like the characters. And once again, that gets back to the whole idea of people. It's got to be about people. You know. Well, like you it definitely said, definitely has to be about people. You, you've been doing it for ten years now. I mean, that's. Uh... Um, not 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 all Star Trek fan films have lasted that long. Most of them haven't. Oh, most don't. You know, yeah. I mean, when you think about it, there's ones that have lasted that long. Let's see, there's uh, Phase Two. I know Hidden Frontier. I think lasted for like six years, um, and they did almost weekly episodes. What they did was nothing short of phenomenal. I mean, now granted, ninety percent of their work was in green screen, um, but I mean, what they did, you know, they did seven seasons probably 25 or 30 episode seasons right 
It was it was amazing what Jeez. they put together. The fact that they were able to write that much. I mean, I think about how long it takes me to put together one screenplay. <laughs> you know, and I think about you know, wow, writing for I could never write for a weekly television series. You know, I would I would be I would be bankrupt. Um, but it's absolutely amazing. You know, when you consider what they were able to put together like that, that's pretty incredible. Sure, mm-hmm. you know, that's pretty darn incredible. So that's I mean, you know, that. kudos has to go to them for for pulling that off. Mm-hmm. So you know, I would say you know, hey, you know, give credit where credits due. And uh, that's, you know, that's one that, you know, I definitely give them a lot of credit. They broke a lot of barriers, but what they were able to put together, long-term complex storylines over multiple years, you know, pretty commendable. Mm-hmm. So not too many fan films, like you said, have been able to uh, to uh, get past that. A lot, of, a lot of fan films end up being like one-offs, you know. Right. They were going to do like a one movie, like this one that's out now, Horizon, which is very impressive. Oh, yeah. uh, it's a one-off story. It's, it's great, but it took the guy like four years to put it together. I don't think he could do another one. Right. Right. You know, you get then you get ones like Star Trek continues. They're putting out things like a machine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> they put out like what five episodes in two years already. You know, they've got up they've got plans up to episode thirteen, and then they're going to retire. So, hmm. you know, pretty incredible. It's just That's pretty awesome. incredible. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, I have, a, I have a question for you, and if if you don't want to answer it, I, I'm totally fine with striking this from this conversation. Um, mm-hmm. As someone that does fan films, when you when you hear about things like what happened with Axanar, how does that how does that affect you guys, um, or does it even affect you guys in in fan film? Does it make you pause? Does it make you make sure all your eyes are dotted and T's are crossed? I mean, what's going on with you guys like in Farragut? Well, you know what, I don't think it affects Farragut directly, um, because um, for one. Um, Farragut is uh, Farragut Films is a five hundred one c four nonprofit. Um, we don't, um, you know, when we're producing an episode for twenty thousand dollars. We can take it down to the penny where the money went. Not one of it. Believe me when I say uh, we don't make any money on an episode. As a matter of fact, we lose money. Um, so I mean, so that's definitely you know a non-issue. Right. Uh, I, I think what you get into. Um, and I'm not going to badmouth the Axnar folks, right, um, right, although I've right. been, I have been, I have been online, I have been vocal. Um, I know the Axnar folks, Outfitters, is probably, is probably uh, my least fan on the planet right now. Um, but I will say that my personal opinion. Now, I'm not an attorney by any means, but the issue comes down to money. If you're going to do a fan film, you're going to do a fan film because you love it. Right. If I'm going to do a fan film and I want to hire my favorite actor to be in my fan film, I'm going to pay, give him money so he'll be in my fan film or my favorite makeup artist or something like that. I can do that. But when I start to say things like, well, I better uh, draw a salary for myself because you know I'm not going to do this for free, it's a fan film. Right. It's not a job. If you start saying that you, as the producer of it, can't do that for free because of how much time you put into it. First off, you haven't put one hour iota more into it than James Colley or Vic or John Broad has. I'm using them or or Nick Cook uh, in uh, Scotland. Or any one of those guys that produce one of these. You haven't put one second more hour than they did. And they don't draw a salary. Because this is a fan film. If you say, I'm not going to put that kind of time into it and not get paid, well, then you need to go into a business and not into making fan films. Right. Because that's not the same thing. When that money starts changing hands as a salary, when you start to go, you're in Southern California where where studio space is a dime a dozen, and it's not that expensive. And you could have rented the studio for six months for twenty or $30,000. And I have this from people who've told me you can and instead you're going to spend half a million dollars to build out a studio, well, that's because you're planning on having a studio to rent out. You're mm-hmm. making a money-making business out of that fan film mm-hmm. in more than one way. In addition to drawing a salary, you're building a for-profit enterprise out of it that you can make money. And don't give any stories about other fan films rent out their sets. Renting out your sets to try to cover the electricity costs is one thing. Building out a studio that you're going to rent for other for-profit films is another. Right. Big difference. Yeah. Big yeah, difference. Right, right. So really, it's it's the lawsuit doesn't say money, but that's really what this is about, in my opinion. Once again, right. I'm not an attorney. Right. Right. But in my opinion, this is really about money. And then when you take this money to the point where you start talking about millions of dollars, 
you don't need millions of dollars to make a good fan film. Right. Horizon made a pretty damn oppressive thing there for 50K. Wow. The average Farragut episode, you know what we spent on our last episode? I want to say under 20. Wow. It's amazing. So, I mean, you know, even, you know, even continues with, with celebrity guest stars and expanding the sets that they co-built with Farragut um, massively with the engineering section and so forth. I think they were asking for $300,000 to make five episodes. Five. Five episodes. Wow. So they weren't asking for two and a half to three million to make one. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, $80,000 to make a 20 minute short that's just filmed in front of a green screen. And yeah. then you have to hear from some of the Axnar fans that it's the best thing ever. Well, what's the best thing ever? You haven't made anything, you're right. not even cast. Right. So uh, there's an arrogance yeah. which I think made it worse for them when they came across. What, I, I think. They may have gotten past a few things had they not gotten arrogant and said, we're not a fan film. We're a professional production. Right. Now you just caught someone's attention. Right. Now you're taking that money and you're saying, we're getting paid and we're professionals and we're not a fan film. But as soon as you got criticized, you say, we're just a fan film. Right. So. Well, thank you. I, t- I mean, I, I think that, I mean, I think that the, the, the key thing is, and what I'm getting is that, you know, people that truly do fan films are doing it you know, with this idea of it being a labor or love. And the issue is not necessarily bringing an actor on that you pay. And it's not necessarily putting some Mm -hmm. money, raising some money for sets or for spacing, but it's, 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 it's when it becomes more than just a labor of love that becomes the issue. You know, we got, we have, we have our first two quote unquote celebrity cameos, if you will, in a homecoming episode of Farragut. I mean, that I've ever dealt with. Um, one of them was we got a cameo by Stan Lee, who plays mm-hmm. an admiral at a point in the story. And w- was that something like that cost ten thousand? No, I don't actually even have any idea what it cost him. But I know it was more of a he just thought it would be fun, kind of a thing than anything else. And then there's a local celebrity in the uh, Baltimore D.C. area, um, Dick Dysel, who goes by the name Count Gore Duvall. He does a horror oh, film. Oh, I grew up I with. You're that. familiar. You grew up with him maybe as Captain Twenty, and then as yeah. Count Gore, and. Um, I got him to play the villain in Homecoming, and that was that was that was a really complicated story because was I sent him an email because I talked to him at cons all the time and said, "Hey Dick, would you be interested in playing a villain in a Star Trek fan film?" He says, "Star Trek fan film villain. When do I have to be there?" <laughs> that was how I got Dick Dysel to be in the film. <laughs> I mean, you know, it was just one of those things where, you know, it just and it, that you know to me that that was you know that was a celebrity that was a fan, you know, now. Right. So a lot of times, too, if you're dealing with a celebrity as a fan, you may have union rules. You have to deal with SAG. You may have to give them something, you know, because right. of SAG rules. Even for something like that, they have to have something from SAG. So, right. I mean, that's understandable. That's understandable. Right. But, I mean, at the same time, you know, it's a, it's a fan film. If, right. if, you know, if you're doing it because, you know, once again, if you're doing it like, well, I'm putting in these kind of hours. I should draw a salary. You know, right. I, no. <laughs> well then, get hired by Paramount and zip then, it. Yeah, then you know, go go get go get a paying job that does something you love. You know? yeah. Because because and you can't tell me it's because I'm putting in this much time. You have no idea. I don't think he has any idea how much someone like John Broughton, how many hours John Broughton. Oh, well, I'm sure. I'm sure. And doing costumes and stuff. He's doing stuff for Farragut Forward now. Months and months and months. They're not planning on starting the film till October. He's making costumes now. He's been working nonstop. Now, filming's in October. And he has a day job too. <laughs> And he has a day job, and he's got three kids at home. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you know, I mean, come on. Yeah, definitely. You know, don't tell me you're putting in more time than that. Is he drawing a salary? No. Yeah. Not a penny. Matter of fact, I know it costs him money. Right. Mike Bednar he used to drive down to the Georgia to build those sets every other weekend. He put like 150 thousand miles on his van. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. You know, did he get paid for that? No. Yeah. So I mean, so that there's to me there's a difference. There's a difference. Yeah, you there know. Is. It, now, now the now, how do I think it affects everyone else? I do feel that the Axnar folks are not against throwing everyone else under the bus with them because they want to use everyone else as an example as to why they should be allowed. Right. Even though they did other things that the other fan films didn't, will that have an effect on it? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Hopefully, not. it could get all fan films shut down. I hope it doesn't. Yeah. 
you know, it would be a real shame because the rest of us, you know, it's the old, you know, does one bad apple spoil the barrel? Uh, you know, I would hope that doesn't happen. Yeah. I would hope that doesn't happen. At the same time, if because of that, that Paramount CVS felt that by whatever end result comes out of the lawsuit that they feel that they have to by then shut everyone else down. I won't be surprised. I wouldn't, I won't be angry. You know, it'd be one of those things where I understand it and I'll move on. Right. It's one of the risks you take when you make a fan film. Yeah. You definitely. have to understand you're playing in somebody else's sandbox. You don't own it. It is not yours. That's you're true. only playing there because they said it's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, like people like make the big deal about the Star Wars fan films. And there's a great community of Star Wars fan filmmakers. But you'll notice something very common about the fact that they say, well, Lucasfilm would have a website and they could put, well, yeah, your fan film had to be under five minutes. You, know, you couldn't make The Crossing, which is 75 minutes long, and put it on there. Right. But more important than that, you'll note that when people pay, play in the Star Wars quote-unquote expanded universe, and you see their fan films, they're never about Darth Vader, Darth Maul, Luke Skywalker, Princess Leia, Han Solo, Chewbacca, C-3PO, R2-D2. They're about Jedi Bob Smith and, uh, you know, this guy over here. But they're about other people in that expanded universe. Right. Which is part of the way that Lucasfilm didn't get mad. You're playing in my universe but you're not touching my stuff. Mm. Right. It's true. Which was a big part of Farragut's basis and why when John created the show, it's not Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. It's another ship. Right. The different crew. <clears throat> We're playing in that universe, and that's why they noticed that the show's called Starship Farragut, not Star Trek. But it's what it is. We're playing in the sandbox, but we're not touching the other guy's matchbox cars. Hmm. Awesome. Very, very rarely, if ever, do we try to even mention, I mean, the whole reason that in The Price of Anything, why Kirk gets shown there at all, because Vic was directing it, he wanted to introduce his new show. Right, right. That actually wasn't even in the script. Shh, I didn't say that out loud, did I? That wasn't in my script. We, we heard nothing. We'll take it out in post. Yep, to take it out in post. <laughs> I didn't say that. Vic added that scene. But, um, <laughs> no, I'm not going to. I'm not going mean, to. It, it was a way for him to introduce himself as a character to kick off his Star Trek and Tenny show. I understand why he did that. Yeah. I don't and have that any, question I don't have for you, 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 you mentioned the other sandboxes that are out there that people play in. Mm -hmm. you, you've been playing in the, you've been playing in the sandbox of, of, of Star Trek for, you know, over, for over 10 years here. Yeah. Is there another sandbox you would mind, you wouldn't mind trying to play in? The most ambitious one I think would be set wise and construction wise, and no one will ever do it. Um, Space 1999. Oh my! Love uh, that show. So I would love. Good. I would love to play Commander Koenig. Mm -hmm. That would be. That would be my dream fan. One of my dream fan film roles. And actually, I was working with James Colley, and that didn't come to fruition. Um, of Star Trek Phase Two, and uh, we had filmed half of an episode, and it ended up uh, things got shut down. But um, we were going to do the Wild Wild West, and um, James was going to be Jim West, and I was Artemis Gordon, which hmm. to me was the character who plays characters. I mean, as an actor, you can't beat that role. I mean, come on. You're the character who plays different characters on screen? I mean, how, how much fun is that? And the, the stuff we'd even filmed, I had I was playing Artie, playing some other guy in a scene where I, I did actually what uh, the original actor did, which was, you know, made up my own makeup and everything for the character I was supposed to become that he was pretending to be and everything. It was a blast. It was a blast. I'm sorry it didn't work out. Yeah. But one of those two, uh, I'm going to say the Wild Wild West, I would jump back on if the opportunity uh, to play Artemis Gordon came around. But, uh, yeah, Commander Koenig, I always thought that would be Space 1999. I always loved that show. So I would like to season. see, season, like to see Space 1999 come back, but Space 2999 come back. Yeah, they'd have to, they'd have to add some numbers to that one. You know? <laughs> if, some, if someone's science, he has to explain it. 19,099. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think you got to get a little more. You to, what was it in The Martian? you got to science the shit out of that, I think. That's right. <laughs> Although it would be kind of fun to create Space 1999 and retro the crap out of it. Oh, I would, you know? I, would, I would want to keep all those sets and stuff. That was part of what made that show so awesome. It is so cheesy, 1970s plastic everything. It's delicious. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful? I just loved it. Even the costume. Stuff. That was actually one of the only things I liked when they went to the second season, um, which was actually two years apart between the two. 
And the guy who took over as the showrunner in the second season had worked for Star Trek. And uh, you'll notice how much this eye and so forth starts to become, try to become Star Trek. Was it the planet of the week? You know, that kind of a thing. And, um, but the one thing I did like that they updated to the second season was the costuming with the jackets and everything like that. It looked to me look way cooler. Some of the pajamas in the first season were a little bit much. <laughs> it was very 70s jumpsuit. That's why. Yes. I think it was very... Little, and you could, see everybody, you could see everybody's bulge. You know, it's just like, you know, some people were Very Sansa Belt, very yes. back of the Sears catalog. Whereas you had, you had the jackets and stuff in the second season, which were kind of cool. They had like away jackets and stuff, which, you know... Actually, that was one of the funnest stories with through the second episode of Farragut called For One of a Nail. That was the one where they went back in time and met George Washington. Mm -hmm. And they were supposed to be beaming down to this frozen episode. planet. So we're getting ready to set up filming. And I said to John, we were doing it, I said, um, we need coats. And he's like, well, why? They didn't wear coats on Star Trek. I said, yeah, but we're supposed to be beaming down to a frozen planet. And then we're going to be outside during the American Revolution War. And we're filming in December oh, in yeah. Smallwood State Park in Maryland. It's going to be cold. I really would like a coat. And he said, no, they didn't have coats. So I went to this uniform supply company, and I bought this. I saw this jacket. It was black and had this gray vinyl, like, armpits and, like, a stripe on it kind of a thing. So I bought one, and I got some scraps of the fabric from John, and I put, like, um, a color band on the sleeves that matched the jersey, and then I put a uh, Farragut uniform insignia on the front. And I said, what about this for a jacket? And he looked at it, and he went, I don't know. And I said, look, and the captain, you could be like Kirk and Rathacon. You can flip your collar up, and the rest of the so you look extra cool. <laughs> they went, okay, we'll try it. We were all ready when that episode came out. Everyone's going to bitch about the jackets. Everyone's going to bitch about the jackets. Nobody ever bitched about the jackets. All we ever got was, where can I buy one of those jackets? <laughs> yeah. And plus, too, the first day of filming out in the middle of winter, John, John looked over me and he went, thank you for that. Yeah, so, I mean, it was definitely, um, <laughs> it definitely in more than one way, we were happy for the coat. <laughs> you know? But, I mean, but that, once again, it was a costume change. With, like, one of the nice things about doing Farragut and not doing Enterprise, Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, is if we change something a little bit, the two-handed Faisal rifle that we came up with, that we use on Farragut all the time. Matter of fact, Phase 2 actually borrowed it for a couple episodes. Mm -hmm. They liked it so much. Um, we had that. We had, um, you know, the jackets, a few other little things. You know, why not? We're not that ship. Stuff can be different on a different ship, right? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Totally agree. Well, uh, what else do we want to ask him before we uh, wrap up this interview here? Anything else that we want to touch on here, Miles? M? Yeah. Th uh, this is what I'd, I'd like to ask you. As a Star Trek fan, the bridge and the sets of the Enterprise is, is hallowed ground. Um, what was it like for you the first time you stepped on the bridge of the Enterprise in the Farragut? Uh, it just uh, was. It, it actually was surreal. It was. It was. It was like. It was. It was. It's like stepping back in time and forward in time at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, you're stepping onto this future place, but you watched it. You know, 25 years ago. So it's just. You know, it was just um, both the Farragut sets and say the Phase Two sets, which are the two that I've been on. It was just um, absolutely amazing moments the first time you set foot on one of those. The, the interesting thing about the Farragut sets in their studio was um, the one door from outside opens right into the one main curved corridor. So as soon as you come in that outside door, you're in the hallway. And it's a curved corridor. You can't see the end of it. It's just the Farragut. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there's all the hallway doors and there's the transporter room around the corner and there's sick bay over here and the, and it's all right there and you really can't see the end of it because, you know, it curves. And it's just like, wow, I'm... It didn't even feel like you were on a set. It's like, I'm, oh my gosh, where am I? I'm, I'm, in, I'm, in the, I'm in a spaceship. I mean, it was really amazing. So then awesome. you go behind the scenes and you realize, oh my God, it's all plywood. Right. <laughs> <laughs> there's a surreal moment when you go behind everything and see how it's all built. Never sit up front at the ballet, my friend. Exactly. That's yeah. exactly Never sit what up front it is. The you do that and you're like, oh my God, that's really, it's press board, you know? <laughs> that, that's made of MDF. You know, I thought it would be like plastic or something. And back that's in, what you can do with paint. Back in the late 80s, um, the, the Air and Space Museum had an exhibit for, the, um, for Star Trek. I remember and, that. 
And I had volunteered. I was a senior in high school, and I volunteered to be um, just to be like just to be there. And I, I got to help out with some of the tours, like you just make sure all your little ducks, all your little guests don't don't deviate. And I was so excited, and they let us um, in to see the preview, uh, so we could really get a close-up look before they closed everything off. And it was really disappointing. <laughs> Wait, that's just a box? What do you mean? No, that was a little. It flips open and it communicates to the world. It's not just a scrim from a cheese grater and a <laughs> matchbox. No. <clears throat> so I learned my lesson there. <laughs> Well, as you're as you're looking at the future of Farragut, and you're looking at going into movie era track, and maybe this is a good place to maybe take it. Where do you, where do you hope the story of Farragut goes? I mean, I know that you're writing some of the stuff, but where where do you hope? Let's say ten years from now, where do you hope Farragut? Oh gosh, I, I I can't even think that for in our future <laughs> right now. I'm I'm trying to think past that next one that I'm writing. Um, I don't know where it goes past that point. Actually, that's a discussion that we had. Um, where does it go past that? The story I'm writing is um, is uh, pretty epic um, in a lot of ways for uh, for what happens to the characters on the show. I, I don't know where they go after that point. That is a very good question. Um, I'd like to think that they go down and people will be going back and watching them and saying, like, wow, I'm still enjoying these after 10 years. Right. At least we can get that from people. I'm hoping yeah. they're going to go back and say, that story holds up. Right. Um, that would be where I would hope to have it in 10 years. But uh, what, where, where the show is in then, oh, I can't think that far. <laughs> too, too far in advance. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, I, you know, Paul, we, we, we really appreciate you sitting down with us at the Sci-Fi Diner tonight and chatting with us about Farragut and all sorts of rabbit trails that we did along the way. It was really awesome chatting with you. Well, it's fantastic talk with you folks, too. I've really enjoyed it. Now, where, if people want to find out more about what is going on in the world of Farragut, where would you point them? Well, you have a couple of places. You can go to the Starship uh, Facebook page or uh, StarshipFarragut.com. Yeah. So pretty easy to find. And uh, the website for FarragutForward.com will be uh, opening up uh, the next couple of months. We're getting ready to do some publicity stuff for that, and that will be opening up for folks to... Uh, Start checking out uh, where Farragut goes after the conclusion episode, Homecoming, which hopefully will be done later this year. We're in post-production right now. Well, now so... We'll see you guys at Shore Leave 2016? Absolutely. Oh, Never miss it. Yeah. yeah we look July forward... 15th and 17th in Baltimore, Maryland. Yeah, we, plan, <laughs> we plan on being there. We plan on being there. I, I assume you're going to put links to Starship, uh, for, Starship Farragut Forward, or Farragut Forward uh, on the uh, website as well, the uh, Starship Farragut Yes. Site. So. Yes, we will be we will be having that as soon as we second in some of the uh, uh, they're working on some publicity stuff coming up in the next couple of weeks and then they'll have some stuff to start being able to post. We're looking at uh, preliminary designs for sets, costuming that they're working on, and so forth. So yeah. fun! It's all going to be very very fun. And, and other than obviously watching the stuff that you you know poured your blood, sweat, and tears into, how else can uh, people listeners jump on board and help support you guys? Well, right now uh, the best way is um, folks that uh, might be in the D.C., uh, uh, Baltimore, Northern Virginia area, um, we're looking for volunteers. Um, there's a lot of costume. There's a lot of set construction. There's a lot of stuff that has to be done. I know John's looking for a location to house some sets um, in the area. Um, we're looking for some folks to uh, willing to uh, pick up a hammer and uh, and uh, you know sling some paint on the walls. Uh, there's also the opportunity. Um, we're looking at bringing some... Uh, other new blood into the show as well, since we're you know changing errors and so forth. Uh, looking for a new talent uh, in front of and behind the camera. Um, you know we're looking to bring in. Uh, we've got a, a brand new composer who came on board uh, in the crossing. He's going to be uh, working with us. Uh, but we're always looking for uh, the opportunity to bring some new uh, effects folks and uh, practical effects and uh, uh, sets and props and. Uh, once again, costuming and uh, acting talent, uh, directing, cinematography. We're looking to uh, bring a lot of new folks on, on board. And uh, since we're bringing the show back up from Georgia, um, we're really looking to see if we can get more uh, folks in this area involved. Right now, we don't have any uh, open fundraisers for Farragut Forward. I know right now, John, is uh, we're kind of uh, keeping that uh, on the small end of things for the first episode, but we will be more than likely opening up 
some kind of a fundraiser probably for Fair to Ford Episode 2 because that's going to be a pretty uh, large-scale production awesome. uh, for us. So we'll definitely be looking for some some uh, financial help at that point. But uh, right now, the biggest thing you can do is you know, get involved, uh, spread the word, um, and if you're in the area or can come in the area for a short period of time, please. Um, you know, I had a friend that said uh, they wanted to help with costuming, didn't know anything about sewing. I said, can you pick up scissors? I said, Sean could use help cutting things out. Right. Sure enough, that guy went there for a weekend. They had a sewing party, and he cut out shirts for a weekend. So <laughs> hey. there's always something that folks can do, you know. Awesome. And if nothing else, be a fan. Comment on uh, YouTube. Um, you know, download the video. Show your friends. Let's get the numbers up. Let's get people out there noticing us. We're right. planning on taking the festivals we can, which is something we haven't jumped on too much in the past. So um, if you hear of a... Uh, sci-fi convention um, that might want us for guests or wants to show the episode uh, anywhere in the country. Um, great. Let's uh, get the information to us. Let's move. Let's well, get there's, them going. There's AwesomeCon here in D.C. I know. I know. They're a tough one to get into. That's a tough nut to crack. That and one. then the Museum of Science Fiction um, is doing Escape Velocity where our show has been invited. Um, ah. <laughs> you guys, oh, that would be great. That, um, that would be really friends, cool from the Mars 100, who are part of the Mars 100, um, they're doing a big fun programmy thing too. It's very STEM and science uh, fiction oriented, but also science science oriented. Oh, I like that stuff. Really cool to if you guys were a part of that too, and that's also... Mm -hmm. in yeah. I like that. I like that. Thank y'all. Thank y'all. I'm going to mark that down. Yeah. I'll send I you like the that a lot. Please do. Please Absolutely. do. That would be excellent. Excellent. Thank you much. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, and if you need a voice actor, I know a really talented voice actor right <laughs> in the show tonight. So. Well, you don't have to flatter me, please. No. I'm, not that, I'm not that good. <laughs> so I I used to be the Majel Barrett of um of a show called uh, Star Trek Defiance. It was a podcast, an audio drama, and oh. I was the Majel Barrett for three years. Wow. Yeah, it was fun. Oh, very fun, very fun. Actually, exactly. I got a lot of I got a, I got a lot of crap from a lot of people when we did two um, the two animated episodes. They said those were the best fair the best uh, Prescott episodes. Why wasn't I like that in the live action one? <laughs> that's because I'm just a voice. It's, so, <laughs> I like voice acting. It's I have a face for voice acting, so I'm gonna. I, I've been told I have a face for radio. So yeah, it works. <laughs> it works. Well, Paul, thank you so much for uh, sitting down and chatting with the Sci-Fi Diner tonight. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's been an absolute blast, and I'll come on anytime. Just give me a call. Let me know when. All right. We, uh, we might have to do that when uh, when the homecoming next year comes out. So. Absolutely. I think you're really going to enjoy it. Awesome. Well, thank you. We'll thank see you, you shortly. Us. Yeah, we'll see you thank shortly. Thank you so much. Okay, you guys take care now. All right. Good night. Bye. -bye. Okay, bye-bye.
Paul yeah. Miles is with us as well. Hi, Paul. It's good to talk to you again. Hi, hey. great to talk to you. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to hey. mute you guys for just a sec. That's fine. And that was M, by the way. M. Hello. Yeah. No, it's just M. She goes by the letter M. That's it. You know, kind of like the um, uh, James Bond M. Yes. Yes. Uh, and uh, and my they, name... I, I would go by P, but people will get the wrong impression. <laughs> yeah. Hey, 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 we have P on the show. Seriously? Go to the bathroom, See, it buddy. It doesn't work. Yeah, it, you know, does. it doesn't work if you say that. Yes. You know? yeah. I'm standing here with P. You know, it, <laughs> it loses something in translation. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty terrible. People get the wrong idea. They yeah. do. They do indeed get the wrong you idea. You call me Big Paul when I was heavy, but, you know, Big P would have been even worse. <laughs> yeah, Big P. <laughs> uh, reminds me of, like, the Dr. Zeus. Big P, Little P. What begins with P? Yeah. 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 Oh, my. Well, we're glad you're here on the show tonight. Let's well, I'm, I am I am pleased as punch to be on. Aw, yeah. that's sweet. There you go. It pleased as punch. Did you notice that alliteration? That's awesome. Mm-hmm. That's the English teacher. I, 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 I do that sometimes. I'm a writer, you know. Right, right. <laughs> we, 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 we come up with words and stuff. Yeah. Perfectly plausible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You, you thank alliterate. Thank you for believing the That's crap right. I just shoveled. <laughs> <laughs> believing crap since 1971. Oh, I, well, actually, since the 60s. But still, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right. I had a nap. I'm sorry. And they just had dinner. So I'm like, woo. That's okay. I'm eating a Subway sandwich. So, you know, it's okay. It, it, it it's all $5 foot long. But there, they're not $5 anymore. No. How know. much are the $5 foot longs? Um, I see. With a bag of chips, it was like $7. Yeah. Which doesn't work really good in the commercial. Yeah. yeah the no. alliteration's not there. It, no. It's gone. It's completely gone. $7 foot long with chips. You know, it just doesn't. It loses something. <laughs> Seven dollar foot long. It just doesn't roll and off the tongue. Chips, yeah, it just doesn't. It doesn't roll off the tongue. Yeah. Apparently, with Jared, though, a lot of things rolled off the tongue. Which <laughs> oh, oh, oh man. I went there. Oh, oh he soon. did. He did. Too soon. Too soon. Oh. <laughs> Too soon. Vicky's oh, foot longs in prison. Oh my god. So there's weather outside. Oh, yeah, it's yeah, nice yeah. out. So awesome con thing. was this weekend. Okay. <laughs> and there goes the show. I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> da, 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 da. Um, All right. Well, uh, so um, I'm sort of laughing. Someone's going to open a door, make a break a rude joke, close the door, talk it to me. Yeah. So <laughs> you guys it. are all too young for that. <sighs> I remember that show. You hush your mouth, sir. Oh well. Okay. Okay. You I used to watch it in reruns. I'm just going to say, there's no way. <laughs> 